everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. This webinar is a presentation of the Clean Energy States Alliance, also known as CESA, and today we are presenting two winning programs from Connecticut and Oregon. These programs were winners of our uh, State Leadership and Clean Energy Awards. And our host for this webinar will be Val Story. Val is a project director here at CESA, and we have guest speakers with us from Connecticut and Oregon to present on their programs. Before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our participants for this webinar are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of this webinar. You can either call in using your telephone or you can connect you to using your computer mic and speakers. A very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions as you think of them throughout the webinar by typing them into the question box on your webinar console and hitting send. We will be doing uh, both presentations, and immediately following that presentation, we'll do a Q&A with the audience. So uh, the best way to make sure that we get to your question is to type it in when you think of it. Final note, this webinar is being recorded. You will find a recording of this webinar, as well as all of our previous webinars, on our website at cesa.org backslash webinars. And with that, I would like to pass it over to our host for this webinar, Val Story. Great. Thank you, Sam. As Sam mentioned, welcome. We're pleased to present to you the second in our webinar series on winners of the State Leadership in Clean Energy. It's a CESA project known around here as the SLICE program. The SLICE Awards are given out biannually by the Clean Energy States Alliance, a nonprofit organization that works with its members to address renewable energy policy, finance, and innovation. As you can see on the screen, our membership consists of state clean energy funds and state agencies from around the country who, through CESA, share information and collaborate to accelerate renewable energy deployment. Today's webinar is brought to you by CESA and consists of a Connecticut Green Bank program and an Energy Trust of Oregon program. Next slide. The SLICE Awards recognize and celebrate state and municipal programs or projects that demonstrate leadership, innovation, and effectiveness in advancing renewable energy. Winners are chosen by an independent panel of judges who also select the programs based on their replicability and impact on transforming clean energy markets in the U.S. You can read more about the SLICE Awards that we gave out this year in a new report which is available at the URL on the screen. Next slide. So today's presentations include Energy Trust of Oregon's Innovative Irrigation Modernization Program. This program, which was developed in partnership with the Farmers Conservation Alliance, replaces open canals with modern irrigation systems, saving water and reducing energy needs, and creating opportunities for new hydro projects. We'll have two speakers for this presentation, and then it will be followed by a presentation by the Connecticut Green Bank on its solar lease program, which offers innovative finance solutions to expand solar for commercial customers, municipalities, and nonprofits. The program has been further expanded by pairing the Connecticut CPACE financing with power purchase agreements. So, for guest speakers today, I'll introduce them before their presentations, and as Sam mentioned, we will do Q&A after each presentation. So, first up is the Energy Trust of Oregon and the Farmers Conservation Alliance. Let me introduce Jed and Stacy. Jed Jorgensen has been at the Energy Trust of Oregon for eight years, where he serves as ETO's non-solar renewable energy on ETO's non-solar renewable energy program team. He has helped to foster the creation of the irrigation modernization program, enabling infrastructure upgrades that achieve significant renewable energy, energy efficiency, agricultural, agricultural, water, and environmental and economic benefits. Before coming to his senses, Jed spent five years managing the campaigns of local, state, and federal political candidates. Stacy Lowry is the program manager for the Irrigation Modernization Program for the Farmers Conservation Alliance. She has extensive experience in management, developing business systems, communication, and finance. 
her ability to build and foster positive relationships through collaboration has proven to drive successful results and long-term partnerships. Jed and Stacy, you are on. Thank you, Val. Thank you, Sam. Hi, everyone. I am Jed Jorgensen with Energy Trust. Energy Trust is a 501c3 nonprofit. We're under contract with the Oregon Public Utility Commission, and we get our funding from two of Oregon's investor-owned electric utilities and three natural gas companies. We give out incentives that look a lot like grants to support energy efficiency and renewable energy projects that benefit the ratepayers of those utilities. And uh, as Val mentioned, I'm here with Stacy Lowry from Farmers Conservation Alliance. Hi, all. I'm Stacy with FCA. FCA is also a nonprofit. We work in pursuit of water management solutions that benefit both agriculture and the environment. FCA began in 2005 when the Farmers Irrigation District of Hood River, Oregon, licensed us the Farmer Screen. It's a device that keeps fish and debris out of irrigation water. Um, it was licensed to us under the condition that we take the farmer screen to market, address institutional barriers to fish screens, and invest profits into other technologies and solutions that benefit both the environment and agriculture. Along the way, we realized that the truest and highest measure of mutual benefit would be to achieve agriculture resiliency. So what we're going to talk about today is a program that we call irrigation modernization. And it's not about outfitting your lawn with uh, Bluetooth enabled sprinkler heads, though that would be uh, very fun and interesting probably. It's about how our food gets produced and the intersections between water, energy, and the environment around irrigated agriculture in Oregon, <clears throat> in Oregon and across the western United States. There's also a story about coordination and working with many stakeholders on big projects that have big challenges and equally large opportunities. We're going to tell the story of irrigation modernization through the viewpoint of this guy. This is Mark Thaliker. He's the manager of the Three Sisters Irrigation District. Irrigation districts are municipal type entities that deliver water to farms and ranches. How they deliver that water is at the center of irrigation modernization. So let's take a look at Three Sisters Irrigation District. Uh, Three Sisters is located in central Oregon outside the town of Sisters, not far from the city of Bend. Much of the area looks something like this, pretty beautiful. For those of you not, for those of you that are unfamiliar with Oregon, which has a reputation for being a really wet, green place, most of Oregon is actually high desert. And all of our agriculture, even the stuff that's in the green part of the state, is irrigated because our summers are very dry. Like most of irrigation districts in Oregon, Three Sisters get their water from a stream, Wychus Creek, a tributary of the Deschutes River. The Deschutes is one of Oregon's major rivers and a mecca for fly fishermen from across the world, thanks to its population of native red-bound trout and steelhead. Three Sisters has been taking water from Wychus Creek during the irrigation season, which is April through September since they were incorporated in 1891. Mark's district is on the small side. It delivers water to 200 farms, covering about 7,500 acres of land in the area. That averages out to farms around 40 acres in size. The water at Three Sisters was moved through open earthen canals. The district's canals and their other water delivery infrastructure were built by hand and with simple machines back in the 1890s. It took about 16 years to dig the main canal. And even a small district has a lot of canals. Three Sisters had about 63 miles of them. Water from Whitehouse Creek was diverted into the main canal by a small dam. The dam had gates on it, doors that open up and down essentially that allowed more or less water to pass into the canal depending on the irrigation need. The water also passed through fish and debris screens to keep the water supply clean for the farmers. The water went down the main canal, which split off into smaller lateral canals. Each of those splits had another hand-operated gate to regulate flow. You can think about it like the blood in our arteries and capillaries. The main canal is like an artery. The lateral canals are more like capillaries. The water in the laterals is what goes past farms for delivery, just like the capillaries deliver blood to our cells. 
So what you're seeing in these photos, up at the top right is the creation of a large main canal in central Oregon. The other photos are of lateral canals. And you can also see a gate at the bottom right and a device called a lift at the top left that delivers water to a farm. In the early days, farms were typically flood irrigated. Over time, many farms moved to pressurized water delivery systems, pumping out of the canal and sending water to different kinds of sprinklers, like this big gun, as it's called, at the top left, or a wheel line at the bottom. The way Three Sisters was built and how it looked and, and uh, operated is representative of many, many irrigation water delivery systems. Most were dug by hand and engineered so that gravity did the work of moving the water. They got the job done of delivering water to farms, but like many things in life, they aren't perfect. Water in open canals is subject to seepage and evaporation, and it's amazing because up to 20 to 50 percent of the water in a canal never makes it to the farm in, a first, in the first place. All those manual gates, like the photo at the bottom right, require operation and maintenance, as do the canals themselves. Fish and debris screens require cleaning and maintenance too, sometimes multiple times per day. You can see an old fish screen at the top right. It was removed from service. At many irrigation districts, much of that old infrastructure is still in use, but it's starting to show its age. In addition, plants and aquatic weeds can be an issue in canals. The top left photo shows what Three Sisters main canal typically looked like at the beginning of the irrigation season full of weeds and debris. People dump things in canals, too. I've heard stories of shopping carts and other stuff. In the winter, trees falling on canals due to heavy snows can weaken their walls. This sometimes leads to a, what's called a blowout, like the photo at the bottom left, a canal rupture that can cause flooding and erosion. Things aren't perfect for the environment, either. At Three Sisters, their diversion dam pictured here prevented fish from going up and down stream. The stream channel itself near the dam had been straightened to make the dam function as well as possible, but that changed how sediment moved in the creek. And for about 100 years, the district dried up Wyshoes Creek in the late summer. That's how things went most of the time. In the summer of 1977, the population of Sisters, Oregon was less than 700 people, many of whom were farmers. A drought devastated the snowpack in the west, leaving almost no water in Wychus Creek. What little water was flowing in the creek was diver diverted to the irrigation district, but it was enough to fulfill only about 10% of the expected water for farmers, a real economic disaster for a farming community. The creek ran dry th through the city of Sisters for even longer than usual. That drought, as it turned out, was a harbinger of things to come. After multiple drought years in the early 1990s and increasing tensions around the environmental challenges related to drying up the creek, Three Sisters farmers realized that conservation might be the key to avoiding future conflict as well as delivering more water to its farmers. Taking the water out of the canal and putting it in a pipe eliminates the losses from seepage and evaporation. 50% of the water that Three Sisters had in its canals was seeping into the ground or evaporating. Putting the water in a pipe changed everything because the conserved water enabled Three Sisters to leave water in stream for fish and make more reliable deliveries to farmers, even under tougher climate conditions. The district started with smaller projects to prove the viability of their piping model, but were pushed to become more aggressive and proactive due to pressure from federal agencies and a ruling protecting habitat for salmon and steelhead. Three Sisters could no longer allow Wychus Creek to dry up. So Mark Thaliker and his board, made up of farmers from the district, decided to modernize their system. It's taken 18 years of blood, sweat, and tears, not to mention a lot of money, both theirs and other people's, but they've accomplished a lot. They've piped 50 of 63 miles of open canals, eliminating seepage and evaporation, and increasing water delivery to farms by 25%. They've saved over 24 cubic feet per second of water. That's a common irrigation district way of quantifying water flow. That water stays in the creek. It equates to more than 10,000 gallons per minute, enough to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool each hour during the irrigation season. 
More flow in the stream reduces water temperature, improving conditions for steelhead, trout, and other native species. By putting the water in a pipe, it also pressurizes that water supply. And where there's excess pressure, you can use a hydropower turbine to convert that pressure into energy. So Three Sisters installed a 700 kilowatt hydropower turbine that now generates about 3.1 million kilowatt hours of electricity annually. Energy Trust was a major funder of the hydro system, providing more than a million dollars in cash incentives for its development and construction, which was made possible by the modernization work. Here's a photo of the new turbine. It's a Chinese turbine with an American generator. And here we are giving away the money with one of Oregon senators, Jeff Merkley, looking on. With all the pipes, they now deliver pressurized water to about half of their farms, eliminating irrigation pumps and saving around 5 million kilowatt hours of electricity annually. Here you can see an old pump lying abandoned, <coughs> lying abandoned in the background. And turning around the other direction, this is a new pressurized turnout at the farm. There's actually too much pressure at this location, so a pressure reduction valve was installed. Room was left to put in a small hydro system at some point in the future, and that could actually provide power for the farm. The pressurized water also opens up the potential for additional water conservation on farm by switching to different delivery methods. A center pivot system like this one, and these are what make those pretty crop rings you see out the airplane window, these are about 90% efficient in their water delivery compared to that big gun that you saw earlier, which might be 50 to 60% efficient. Here's also a picture. Three Sisters also changed their diversion dam so that upstream and downstream fish passage is possible. Here's the old dam. Now the old dam is gone. They installed a farmer screen to keep fish and debris like wood and leaves out of the irrigation water. The farmer screen is self-cleaning, requires no electricity, and has no moving parts. Here's another view of the farmer screen. They also restored about a quarter mile of stream channel to improve habitat. Because there's so much less canal and so much more automated equipment, operations, maintenance, and safety have all been improved, and costs have been reduced. Irrigation district crews that used to spend their time fixing and operating things are now spending increasing amounts of time putting pipe in the ground. This is a win for agriculture, the local economy, and wildlife. So let's fast forward to 2015. Another severe drought hit central Oregon and much of the west. For Three Sisters, this was very comparable to 1977. Snowpack in the Cascades was only a fraction of normal. Mountains were bare and glaciers were melting. But what happened in Wyshoes Creek? In Mark's words, we were able to maintain a daily average flow of 20 CFS while delivering 20 to 40 percent of expected water to farmers. This was in addition to generating clean, green, renewable power and conserving energy. Last year's drought in 2015 was a very different experience and a tremendous example of Three Sisters' hard work paying off. Their creek stayed wet. This photo was actually from the middle of that drought. And the farmers had energy, water was saved as well. Excuse me, the farmers had water, energy was saved and generated. Three Sisters' efforts have been a huge success, but it took them a lot of time, 18 years, as Stacy mentioned, and they're still at it. That came with a lot of learning about the stakeholders that care about Wyshoes Creek, the permitting agencies, grant writing and funding cycles in order to secure financing. It's a lot of money and a lot of elbow grease to put in 50 miles of pipe. And that's on top of all the other work that, a dis that the district had to do to deliver water. For perspective, it's also important to remember that Three Sisters is a relatively small irrigation district. Nearby irrigation districts operate canal systems many times the size of Three Sisters. Across the Deschutes Basin, that's the area that all drains into the Deschutes River and its tributaries, there are about 1,600 miles of earthen irrigation canals, and they're moving huge volumes of water. A little bit of pipe has been put in in a few areas, and it's really big. That's 10-foot pipe that you see in this photo that was installed uh, in the process of, of building out another hydro facility. The potential benefits of modernization in the area are enormous. 
but the scale of the challenge is huge, and most irrigation districts have their hands full maintaining their current systems. By watching the efforts of Three Sisters and a few other irrigation districts exploring piping and hydro, we recognized an opportunity. At Energy Trust, we've been targeting irrigation hydropower projects to meet our, our renewable energy goals. We realized that hydropower is best seen as the end result of modernization. If more districts were able to move forward successfully with modernization, we would be able to support more hydropower projects. In addition, the entities interested in the other interrelated benefits of modernization, like water conservation and fish habitat restoration, would also see more successes. Those additional benefits, just like the revenues from hydropower, can be very significant in financing modernization projects. What was missing was a coordinated, comprehensive approach, one that helped multiple irrigation districts move forward together, learning from and supporting each other, getting help and advice from other district managers that had moved through modernization processes to learn from past mistakes and successes. We felt sure that by doing this, we could help irrigation districts to modernize much faster than they could on their own. And what you're seeing uh, before was a, a picture of another main canal in central Oregon. So what we did is we contracted with FCA, and together we've been creating the Irrigation Modernization Program. Our goal is for FCA to be a resource, a guide, and a catalyst for irrigation district managers who want to move their districts through modernization processes. Over the last year, with funding and staff support from us, FCA has created a methodology for developing individual irrigation district modernization strategies and, through hundreds of conversations with stakeholders, built a large coalition of irrigation, nonprofit, financial, federal and state agency, political, and private sector partners. By the end of 2015, less than a year after starting this effort, 12 irrigation districts had signed up to be the first participants in the program, including all eight districts in the Deschutes River Basin, which is one of Oregon's largest irrigated areas. Assessments of the potential benefits associated with modernization paid for by Energy Trust are now underway at each of the 12 districts enrolled in the program. When completed by the end of this year, each assessment will identify the renewable energy, the energy efficiency, agriculture, water, environment, and economic benefits associated with modernization. These benefits, quantified and aggregated across a large number of districts, are not just the sales pitch for why modernization is important. They really do provide a new way to approach financing such large infrastructure projects. We'll also be laying out various potential impl implementation approaches, be they phased over time or faster full build-outs and quantifying the differences and benefits for different approaches. Each irrigation district will have to choose the implementation approach that's right for their situation. After a district board selects a preferred approach, then permitting and financing will begin, followed by contracting and construction. These photos show piping and construction of another irrigation hydropower project in Central Oregon as well. And while the total potential benefits associated with the 12 irrigation districts enrolled in the programs are not fully quantified, it's not unreasonable to expect that they'll be 10 to 20 times greater than the benefits seen at Three Sisters, including the installation of up to 10 megawatts of hydropower or more. In addition, the potential benefits available at the first 12 districts may only represent really 10 to 15 percent of the total benefits available in Oregon and a small fraction of the potential across the West. And so this is where we circle back to the beginning. The need for irrigation modernization and the benefits it can bring, it's not exclusive to Oregon. And conversations with stakeholders have identified a very strong interest in expanding the delivery of the program to other states. This program has wide-reaching implica implications across the drought-plagued Western US where much of the water for farms is delivered through aging, leaky irrigation district canal infrastructure. From the start, we designed this program with replicability in mind. The program is producing open source tools, methodologies, and process guides for irrigation districts and the entities that are helping irrigation districts move forward with modernization planning and implementation. We're really excited about the potential for irrigation modernization to make rural agriculture communities more resilient against drought 
while improving operations and reducing costs, and making water supplies more reliable. We're excited about helping farmers save energy by getting rid of old irrigation pumps, and we're excited about supporting projects, hydropower projects, that are part of a system working to improve environmental conditions, allowing fish to move up and downstream and putting more water back into our rivers. We're also very honored that CESA recognized us for their 2016 State Leadership in Clean Energy Award. And we'll be working hard to make the benefits that Three Sisters achieved a reality for many more irrigation districts. Thank you, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Great. Thank you, Jed. Thank you, Stacy. That was very informative. That was a great historical overview of irrigation districts, putting it all in context for us. Just a reminder to the audience, if you have any questions, to please type them into the question dialog box. Let me start with um, asking you to repeat a few things and maybe expand on a few items you already talked about. One, curious about your partnership. Had FCA and ETO worked together before, and how has the partnership benefited one another, and if this were to be replicated in other states, does FCA work throughout the West Coast? I'll start the, the beginning of that, and, uh, and maybe Stacy can fill in sort of the end of that. So Energy Trust and FCA had um, maybe been orbiting each other for a number of years. Uh, we were working with irrigation districts at Energy Trust trying to make hydropower projects happen. Um, we knew that FCA was working with some of those same folks on fish screening projects. Um, uh, as we got to know each other a little bit, we saw some opportunities, uh, and FCA helped us with some studies early on that identified some of the uh, irrigation modernization benefits that came along with doing hydropower projects. Um, so some of those early studies uh, helped inform the way that we were thinking about hydropower uh, and, its, and its role with irrigation. Um, and that then led to a number of years of conversations about how we might best um, help all these different benefits get advanced. So uh, it, it was sort of an e evolving process um, or an evolution, I guess, in terms of our relationship that eventually led to the formation of this program. Uh, and I'll let Stacy speak for FCA, but yes, uh, the, the goal is to go more broadly than, than what Energy Trust can do just in Oregon. Right. And we have ongoing and extensive relationships working throughout the West as well with uh, our fish screen work. And to build on what Jed said, we've been in the same position. We're, we're, we've been placing modern infrastructure, a fish screen, in an aging system. And so looking at this holistically, we realized that we could see more benefits by looking at the entire system and creating a mo modernization approach versus individually going in and trying to place modern infrastructure in a, within a working system. And so our goal is right now this year working with our current 12 districts and then continue, continuing to expand throughout the Western United States and beyond. Yeah. And what we anticipate really is that we'll work these this first set of districts through uh, this initial assessment process, and we'll we'll get the results of that process, have a better understanding of the total potential benefits that that first set can bring. We expect that will lead to uh, some work around how we're going to finance the potential projects uh, that will result um, from that, uh, and we'll start developing the plans around that. At the same time, as those districts are moving forward with their more specific planning processes, we expect another set of districts to begin the next phase of assessment work. So we'll be bringing on another cohort of irrigation districts to move forward together uh, in assessing their potential uh, around modernization. Anything else to add? I think there, it's Stacey? great. Yeah. Perfect. We look forward to that assessment report. A couple more questions for you. Could you repeat how much hydro you've installed due to this program? Uh, well, I, we can't make any claims yet from this 
specific program, we're starting to get some results back uh, about some potential that we're seeing in Central Oregon, and it, it really is pretty phenomenal. Um, contextually, though, uh, I can tell you we've done projects in the past uh, with about a dozen, well, we've done about what we would call a dozen irrigation hydro projects. Some of those are repeat customers. For example, we've worked with Farmers Irrigation District up in Hood River four times on uh, helping them to install additional pipe in their system. That additional pipe uh, led to more water flowing through their existing hydropower system, so it increased the generation there. Uh, obviously, we helped out with the, the project at Three Sisters Irrigation District. Some of those other photos were of a five megawatt hydropower installation at Central Oregon Irrigation District. Um, so there's there's been about a half dozen new irrigation hydro projects that have happened. Uh, what they haven't been doing, with the exception of Three Sisters, is happening really in that comprehensive way that looks at the kind of end-to-end modernization approach. And so that's what we're trying to do differently. Um, the other projects were more standalone facilities. Mm -hmm. And this program will also help accelerate that work. I think as we're looking at Three Sisters, we see as an individual project for a very aggressive approach that that took 18 years. And so by bringing multiple districts together, we're hoping to accelerate and move, move forward more quickly. Great. And can you talk a little bit more about the interest from other irrigation districts and potentially other states too. Has it involved a lot of outreach on your behalf? You also mentioned the involvement of FDA. What has their involvement been like and who's doing the outreach and how are other district managers coming to the table? Yeah, it's, um, that's, that's an interesting thing. You know, the, this whole uh, program has been a little bit of a field of dreams model. Uh, where we've we've built it and and they have arrived. Uh, we have done almost no outreach to actual irrigation districts. Uh, the districts themselves have self-selected uh, to to come and and talk with us for the most part about how they can participate, which is really fantastic. Uh, you know, we really need irrigation district partners that. Uh, want to move forward. You know, we can't drag people down a process that they don't want to participate in. So by self-selecting, that that kind of guarantees that that is going to happen that way. Um, FCA has done a tremendous amount of outreach to other stakeholders that are involved. You know, there's a lot of um, NGO organizations that care about fish, that care about water in, in rivers, that work in um, some of the same areas. Uh, with both with irrigation districts and with state and federal agencies. So kind of the, the way that a lot of that outreach has happened or is happening is to try to be a bridge between the irrigation districts that want to move forward uh, and getting everybody else on the same page about what those potential opportunities are, how they may develop over time, um, and what the right process is for each specific area. There's no irrigation district that is like another irrigation district. Even the ones that are in the same basin, the same general area, they're all different. They have different landowners uh, involved. They have different stakeholders involved. Um, and they have different challenges. There are a lot of environmental challenges right now that are um, driving irrigation districts to seek solutions. and um, Timing is everything in life, and we're, we're fairly well set up to provide a, a wide and robust set of solutions for irrigation districts and the other stakeholders that are, that are seeking different ways of doing things than the current status quo. Thank you. A couple more questions. I'm jumping back to the, the hydropower in the irrigation districts. Is that is the power, the electricity, just used on farm, or is that sold to utilities? How is that being managed? Yeah, great question. It depends. Uh, some of the the larger installations are essentially merchant 
plants, um, they're standalone, they're selling directly to the utility. Uh, that picture that showed the, um, the farm turnout where there was excess pressure, that's a place where a smaller system could be installed that might net meter or be used to deliver energy directly to a farm. Uh, we're seeing those kinds of projects starting to happen um, in some other parts of the state, and so they haven't, the, the smaller on-farm projects haven't yet happened uh, as a result of this irrigation modernization work yet, um, but we expect they will, uh, and we're seeing them already through some other um, and a similar modernization work that we're helping out with in uh, in farther east in Oregon in the Wallowa County area, where um, some other piping is happening that that has yielded some smaller projects. Great, thank you. Looks like we have oh one more question. One question just came in. Let's see. Is the Mm. Is there any movement to store the electricity from the irrigation districts? Another excellent question. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is something that we have discussed, and there's some opportunities around that. You might think of it as being like a modular uh, pumped storage solution where if the uh, site conditions were appropriate, you could put uh, like a, a water tank on a hillside near a canal um, and then have a, uh, a hydro turbine that could operate both as a pump and a turbine located off of the, the new piped canal uh, that could pump water up into that storage tank, essentially storing the energy up there and then release it later into back into the, the pipe. Um, we haven't done any of those yet in Oregon, and I'm, I, there's some folks in California that have been thinking about that N-line energy, uh, I believe was the, the first folks that um, shared that concept with me. Um, so I, I don't know if it's happening yet. It hasn't happened in Oregon, but it's, it's something that we're kind of keeping our eyes on. Um, Oregon doesn't yet have very robust markets for um, energy storage, so uh, a project like that at this point would really only look like a power plant and there's not a lot of ancillary services that would be able to be um, monetized to to really uh, capture all of the potential benefits that those kinds of projects would bring. They would also probably be relatively small. You know, most of the pumped storage that people normally think about is gigantic, uh, you know, a, a, a gigawatt of energy, whereas these would be in the... the single-digit megawatt class, probably. So um, it's, it might make sense uh, regionally um, for some of the more remote grid areas that um, might have uh, issues that, that need to be addressed. So, but we haven't seen it yet. All right. Thank you for all the, that information. If folks have further questions, you can reach Jed and Stacy at their emails, which is shown on the screen. Or, of course, you can email us and we can find an answer for you. Jed and Stacy, thank you so much for your presentation and for joining us today. Thank you, Val. Thanks, Val. We appreciate it. Our pleasure. Congratulations on your award. Thank you. Okay, we are going to move on to our second presentation by the Connecticut Green Bank. We have two presenters. Fiona Stewart is a Senior Associate of Clean Energy Finance at the Green Bank, which she joined in 2012 with an initial focus on the creation of a cloud-based platform for private capital providers under the Green Bank's Smart E Residential Lending Program. She currently manages the operations of the Connecticut Solar Lease Commercial Program. Joining her on today's webinar is Ben Healy, Director of Clean Energy Finance at the Connecticut Green Bank, where he helped 
helped create the nation's leading commercial property assessed clean energy program, CPACE, structured innovative deals to enable solar investment for non-investment grade properties, and built clean energy investment partnerships with non-traditional financing partners, such as foundations and crowdsourcing platforms. Fiona and Ben will turn it over to you and a reminder for the audience to feel free to use the question dialog box to type in your questions throughout the program. Thanks. Thanks, Val. Um, this is Fiona uh, from the Connecticut Green Bank. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry we don't have a great number of pictures like the, the wonderful presentation of the Oregon uh, Energy Trust in Oregon. Um, but we're hoping you guys are excited about what we're going to present to you today. Um, just a, a little dive into what we'll be covering. Um, just an intro to us, uh, then the CT Solar Leap 2 program, um, and then diving in through some structures and a case study of uh, our nonprofit program, and then uh, back end little lessons learned, and then questions. So diving in, some of you may or may not be familiar with uh, the Green Bank model. Um, it is a, kind of a, a new model of banking. It's a public financing authority that leverages private capital um, with limited public dollars to accelerate the growth and deployment of clean energy and clean energy markets. How about us? Specifically, the Connecticut Green Bank is the first green bank in the nation. We were created by our legislature's uh, Public Act 1180 um, as a successor to the Connecticut Clean Energy Fund, which was uh, grant and subsidy based. Um, our focus is uh, to support the legislature's um, comprehensive energy plan and to finance clean energy. Um, for us, clean energy includes renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, alternative fuel vehicles, and then other infrastructure programs. Um, currently, we have a, a balance sheet of uh, approximately $110 million in assets. Um, and how we are supported is through uh, a surcharge on electric ratepayer bills um, that provides approximately 27 to $30 uh, million a year in investments. Uh, this is the Reggie Fund. Uh, about $5 million a year. We also uh, have federal competitive solicitations and uh, non-competitive resources and private capital. So diving into why we're here today and what uh, our program uh, won the SLICE Award for is the CT Solar Lease 2 program. It is uh, the second edition of our CT Solar Lease 1 program, which is the nation's uh, first residential uh, PV financing program uh, that combined ratepayer funds with private capital to leverage federal incentives. Um, that was a, a pure residential lease program. And in restructuring and figuring out what we were going to cover next, uh, we identified uh, a couple of market sectors that were being underserved. So. Uh, CT Solar Lease 2, we did still have a residential component to it. Um, and then we expanded it to commercial properties, um, particularly uh, commercial in infrastructure, so municipalities, uh, and then nonprofit organizations and mid-market commercial entities. Um, and these last two are what we will be focusing on um, because it's the kind of unique and innovative uh, aspect of the program because they're combined with uh, commercial property assessed clean energy, which we call CPACE. It's a separate program here in Connecticut. And diving into that program really quick, which oh, we'll do that after. Um, so in identifying uh, a, a new market, we we recognize the fact that nonprofits um, have kind of two upfront, upfront barriers, which include a lack of upfront capital and then the lack of tax equity appetite to um, take on the federal ITC. By using the CPACE benefit assessment lien um, as a credit enhancement tool, uh, we are able to offer these uh, long-term PPAs um, to nonprofits and non-investment grade commercial entities, which really 
opened up the market, allowed private investors to get comfortable with uh, the comfortable with the PPAs on the properties. So Fiona's given a, a great intro, and I'll uh, defer to her to, to walk us through a few more slides. But before I do that, this is Ben Healy speaking from the Green Bank as well. Wanted to simply take a moment to say we're about to go into sort of deep into finance territory, and uh, I know every day that's not what folks necessarily are, are working on uh, in our partner organizations throughout the country. Um, so just a couple sort of quick notes on sort of level settings, and folks might know all this already, so apologies, but uh, essentially what we are trying to do is be the third party owner uh, of solar systems for entities that, to these two upfront uh, top bullet points, don't have the capital or desire to you know, pay, pay out of pocket to, to go solar. And when we say lack of tax equity appetite, that could be either a nonprofit that doesn't pay taxes and therefore doesn't benefit from the federal investment tax credit, or it could be any kind of commercial entity or municipality, um, but let's say with a commercial entity, that might not actually have the tax appetite, might not be your traditional Walmart or Target, Whole Foods, Home Depot, what have you, that has traditionally been targeted and offered long-term power purchase agreements, meaning the, the 15 to 20 year financing that really allows uh, these projects to both go solar and do it in a way that's not only zero cash down, but also saving money from day one. And that's really what we were trying to do provide for a whole swath of the market the opportunity to go solar, to uh, essentially engage in a long-term relationship with the Green Bank where we would provide financing, own, operate, maintain solar systems on their properties and do it in a way that could leverage in private capital using just a little bit of our money in an investment mechanism where those that might have tax equity appetite, and we'll get to that in a little, can really take advantage. So I just want to uh, be thoughtful. We might speak in a little bit of finance jargon throughout this conversation. We, we fall into that. If that happens, Val, feel free to check us or others should ask questions. But what we're going to do over the next few slides is really try and help folks get a sense of the structure that we built, how it works in overcoming these particular barriers so that the solar market can be much more widely accessible, and how others could replicate it using some of the tools we put together. So. Pardon me for interrupting. I'll turn it back over to you, Fiona, to take us through the next couple of slides. No, oh, thanks, Ben. Um, so our next slide is offering just a little information on our our PACE, the Property Assessed Clean Energy for Commercial Pro Projects in Connecticut. Um, there's high-level security interest. Um, it's attached to the property. Um, it sits above the, the primary mortgage, which uh, we go out and get lender consent from, and then it stays with the property for following transfer of ownership. Um, there's also a non-accelerating obligation. Um, foreclosure is limited due to, to past due portion of uh, the contracted power purchase agreement or lease payments. Um, it's long-term, the, the PACE assessment, uh, up to 25 years. And the Connecticut Green Bank's role, uh, we're the statewide administrator for the program, um, and we also uh, do data and pipeline aggregation and then uh, have lent uh, money, but uh, we also have others uh, bring their own capital to, to the market. And so to focus in just for a moment on the top bullet point here, the high level security interest, what we want to spend just a moment focusing on, because this is really where the replicability question comes in, not just in what we've been able to scale so far in Connecticut, but what we hope to be able to bring nationally, is the fact that because PACE, this property assessed clean energy mechanism, allows for a benefit assessment, a municipal tax lien essentially, that is attached to the property and sits above any other mortgage interest. What you've effectively done is credit enhanced all of your local nonprofits, your retail, your warehouses, your office buildings, anybody that's not investment grade. And again, that, that's really the goal here from a financial markets perspective is without using any public capital, this is simply just using 
the legal tool of PACE, and by applying it here, we're opening up the market in a way that many more participants with much worse credit, as it were, from a uh, capital markets perspective can access. Keep in mind, the residential market has done very well in solar because any company can go out and ask for a FICO score, and that's a very easy analysis, and you're in or you're out. On the utility side of the market, the same is true. You have a long-term power purchase agreement with an investment-grade entity, or the big commercial, the same is true. What we're solving for here is a whole part of the market that has been excluded that is hard to underwrite, that's hard to look at from a credit perspective, and what we're trying to do is really make that uh, simple, replicable, scalable in any state that is looking at or has proposed or enacted a, a pay structure uh, can follow this model. So let's, uh, let's go from there. So now when we dive into this a little, and uh, we promise we'll get to some pictures soon, um, but stick with us for just a second. Essentially, again, and Fiona spoke to this at the beginning, the role of the Green Bank is a little bit of public money, a lot of private capital. That's, that's how we try and structure our projects, and we do it in a way where that private capital gets paid back so that eventually the Green Bank can work ourselves out of a job in that particular sector. What we did here was we essentially put together a fund. The Green Bank is, in fact, acting like a solar city or a uh, Sun Edison. You know, may, they, may they recover from bankruptcy. Um, a similar type of entity where we own and operate and essentially put together the full capital stack, meaning tax equity from a bank, debt from a different bank, Green Bank using our dollars in a variety of subordinated debt and equity roles. We don't need to get into the weeds here. But essentially serving to originate, sponsor, own, and operate uh, a set of projects across the state. Out of that $70 million fund, about $25 million, so call it 10 megawatts, has been deployed across 50 projects, and some of those have been rated municipalities and schools and corporations. But the real innovation here and where we're proud and where we're building in the next fund that we're out raising right now has been these unrated commercial, industrial, and nonprofit credits, again, secured by PACE. So that's been about half of the commercial portfolio. And these are small projects, and some of them are some of them are on the get up to a megawatt. But we're really trying to make this accessible to those not who are doing huge ground mount solar farms, but 100 kW on a Boys and Girls Club, the uh, JCC project that we'll talk about shortly, others of that ilk. This is about accessibility and availability of finance. And what's been also powerful from a local economic development perspective is we've got a ton of local developers, contractors, installers who aren't the big boys, who don't have access to the national capital markets. And what the Green Bank has done is essentially built a series of partnerships across the state. The local players who are trusted, who often have these relationships with community-based uh, community organizations of various kinds, are then able to actually offer our financing product and develop, deliver on it on, on their own. Okay, so this is just a terrible picture, not nearly as pretty as the Oregon countryside. What I want to focus folks on is, is uh, and of course this will be available offline, is really the bottom right corner of this. What we're showing is a complicated financial structure that we put together with the Green Bank basically setting up a special purpose entity, the CT Solar Lease, that will be the owner and operator of, of these assets over time. We went out and sourced tax equity, as you can see, U.S. Bank, debt from private capital as well. But the key is, from the upfront perspective, uh, we were able to include traditionally excluded credits, these not-for-profit and other commercial credits. And it was because of the power of the PACE tool linked to a PPA. And so I'm going to flip to the next slide, which dives a little bit deeper into that bottom right corner and basically just speak to what's going on here. And, oh, it looks like we've got some of the slide, things are going off the slide, but it's uh, <laughs> no big deal. What's happening in that bottom right corner is essentially showing the way in which the PACE tool works. The not-for-profit uh, would essentially pay back their PPA through a municipal tax lien. It then gets passed through to a PACE servicing entity overseen by the Green Bank and that goes into the fund. And what the PACE lien is doing 
sort of off the off the chart, as it were, is providing the security that the debt providers as well as the tax equity need to see to get comfortable just going forward with the project as it stands. So now let's get to the fun. This has all been the theoretical. What this has meant is that projects like the JCC of Greater New Haven, a you know hundred year old organization that's been in its current facility for twenty years, got a significant facility with you know a pool and uh, you know squash courts and all the fun that you could imagine having in South Central Connecticut any given uh, uh, Sunday morning. Um, you know was not able to get. Uh, financing for a solar project it wanted to do. It actually already had CHP on site. It was wanting to go green. There was a whole leadership team excited about it, but the solar just couldn't come together because without the investment grade credit, they weren't able to uh, make the move. And so what we were able to do by using the PACE structure um, was essentially say, okay, uh, we can do this. this. This credit becomes good enough. And so, in effect, what happened was went out with a local contractor, um, took a look at the structure. In this case, uh, ended up being carports, uh, visually arresting, beautiful. I encourage anyone who's driving uh, up uh, 95 or 91 in Connecticut anytime soon um, on your way on your way to, to to the finest points that the state has to offer to to pull on off. And the carports. Um, uh, constitute about 750 kW of, of installation, about half of the JCC's uh, electrical dem demand. So when we look at this all together, and you can see a sort of picture of the carports down in the lower right corner, this was a sizable project. It was um, significantly reducing their electric bills and uh, all done with no money up front for the JCC and in a way that uh, really delivered on the promise of what the Green Bank is trying to do using private capital, uh, leveraging a little bit of our dollars up front. So we'll end with the lessons learned because I think this is where we want to be able to say this is something we hope can uh, really take flight throughout the country. Um, you know, the, the partnership flip tax equity structure we've done has been widely used. You don't need a public entity necessarily to be the sponsor the way we did. Um, the PACE uh, structure is, uh, you know, in, in dozens of states around the country now available in some way, shape, or form. And putting those two together can really be quite powerful. And so what we've done here, which we would love to share, talk about more, um, be partners with others in, in uh, advancing because certainly the industry's advancement uh, will only be good for, for a little market like Connecticut that doesn't necessarily uh, drive things on our own, is we've already gotten a set of investors comfortable with the PACE mechanism as a means to credit enhancing these investments and uh, allowing a whole new uh, group of, of entities, of nonprofits and others, to get solar. Uh, we've done that in a way that U.S. Bank, which is one of the leading national tax equity players, has been comfortable with, as well as debt providers. Um, we have documentation that reflects this. It has been approved by Capital Markets, and be happy to share it. And then from a sort of program administration and management perspective, would be thrilled to talk about that at, ad nauseum, but um, basically figuring out how do you help your local uh, players in this market understand it, sell it, deliver it, replicate it, um, has been a primary focus of, of the whole team, and Fiona really ha, uh, has managed it just incredibly well. And so that's all part and parcel. Putting together a financing story doesn't mean much unless you've actually got a delivery mechanism to grow, replicate, and scale. And that's what the markets need if you're going to bring in the cheap capital that makes this attractive in the first place. So it's an iterative process, but it's been done once here. We're in the process of raising fund number Three, I guess it would be, and um, excited to continue to do more. So with that, why don't I wrap things up? That's uh, email addresses for both of us. Happy to uh, take any questions, Val, that might have come in, or uh, otherwise let folks return to their uh, regularly scheduled programming. Great. Thanks, Ben and Fiona.
was very comprehensive, and I certainly appreciated the, the Finance 101 review. That was very helpful, and hopefully it helped others as well. So we have a few questions for you, and audience, feel free to type in your questions, and we will try to get to them. First, how do these projects come to the Green Bank? Do you issue RFPs? Do you rely on solar contractors to bring them to you? What's the outreach mechanism? Sure. Um, I mean, part of what we love about this program and part of the challenge as well is, is managing the local uh, uh, excited uh, contractor, developer, installer partners uh, who are looking to the Green Bank to help bridge these financing gaps. And so we take that seriously. And so, no, it's very much not an RFP uh, approach, although we, we might do that on the capital raising side. And uh, we're a little unusual in that way. We'll go to banks and actually issue them competitive solicitations to give us their money. Um, so trying to flip the script on that. Uh, but we're able to do that because we have worked quite hard to develop the and cultivate the local, what we call the kitchen table salespeople, as it were, whether or not that kitchen table is actually to a homeowner or, in this case, uh, you know, across the desk uh, at a local businessman's office or nonprofit leaders. And so really, they're out knocking on doors uh, and doing it with our, our financing standing behind them. And that helps make them a credible partner for the local institutions that are interested in taking advantage of it. We provide some objective uh, reality and sort of the good housekeeping seal of approval. But uh, it also provides us uh, resiliency from a financier's perspective because we have dozens of local uh, contractors, in addition to some of the, the larger regional and national players, who are saying, yeah, this, this financing actually helps make these projects work, and they're independently going out there and putting it to work, and then we stand behind them. So it's, it's very much a partnership model. and. Uh, that comes with its challenges, but, but certainly how we plan to continue to develop. Great, thanks. Here's a two-part question for you. Did you, as you were putting together this program and thinking about solar releases, did you consider any loan-to-own programs? Uh, if so, yeah. or if not, why or why not? And is um, any suggestions for states that do not have a commercial base program? Sure. Well, so uh, we, we think about the market very much uh, not as monolithic either in terms of customer preferences for ownership or third party, lease or PPA, as well as differentiated between residential, commercial, and different uh, customer classes. So on the resi side, uh, we absolutely started with both a loan and a uh, lease program and essentially trained up the same contractor base so they could be responsive to each uh, set of customer demands. And uh, we've decided on the resi side that it's very much clear the market has sort of taken over, doesn't need our support with respect to prime customers, those with you know credit scores of, above a certain level. And so we've stepped out of that and focused on the LMI and when it comes, I'm sorry, low and moderate income um, or credit challenged customer base. When it comes to the commercial sector, uh, we actually launched first with just the PACE program as our lending platform, not for third-party ownership, but straight out uh, direct ownership. Um, that continues to be uh, our flagship on the commercial side. Um, if you're looking to do something outside of PACE, I'd be happy to talk, and I think any of us would be happy to talk about how you serve non-investment grade credits, uh, for, with an ownership program outside of PACE, but it, it, there's a set of challenges um, that PACE overcomes, which is why we like it so much and would certainly encourage that approach. Uh, so to your question, though, Val, the, the way it ends up working with our local guys is they know that they can go into the PACE bucket and just offer a loan if that's what a customer prefers, but more and more it's clear that there's a customer preference um, especially among the nonprofits for whom the tax appetite just isn't there and the, the federal benefits don't mean anything, uh, to, to go the third-party route. Um, having both is clearly important. We, we like that flexibility. And um, I think, though, regardless, we, we look at the pace structure or the more challenged credits as critical to being able to obtain sustainable and cheap capital that will make these deals uh, pencil out. 
Okay, thanks. So, Ben, you mentioned that the, the PACE program was the preferred option. So were there other credit enhancement opportunities that you considered, or if folks are interested in this, should they contact you if they're interested in learning about other credit enhancement tools? Yeah, I mean, we could certainly talk about different approaches. I mean, there's strategies associated with on-bill financing that, that folks like to look at and that um, have shown some, some success. Uh, even in the small business world uh, here in Connecticut, uh, of course there are, um, you know, the, the, there's the ability to use if, if the capital is there, uh, loan loss reserve or other such, you know, sort of more traditional structures. Um, the challenge is really thinking about it at scale and how do you get beyond um, the obstacles uh, beyond doing the first few projects, and so. Uh, we've, we've settled on pace among these different options because there is a capital markets appetite. I mean, when we run, when I say we run capital RFPs, I'm, I'm not joking, and we get folks saying, here's $100 million, can, can I put it to work with you? Uh, and, and we then get to make choices based on who can do it most attractively. It's because the Connecticut program relies on a structure that the markets uh, like and see that there's going to be plenty of volume coming behind it. And I think really that's a, that's a critical insight of how we run our programs, uh, looking towards where a market-based solution wants to be and can we help facilitate that in the short term. Uh, PACE certainly does that most cleanly for us based on our experience, but certainly happy to brainstorm offline with anyone on uh, some of the choices we've made and other options we've considered. Thank you. And for those of you interested for more information, Ben and Fiona's email addresses are up on the screen. Just following up on that, you mentioned replicability. Will you be publishing a how-to guide, or do you have how-to advice on your website? We don't have a how-to advice on the website, although I like that idea. Um, we do make available all of our standard documentation and structures um, upon request. We tend to try and keep track of it since a lot of it is, is somewhat market sensitive, just so we can let our partners know where it's going. Uh, but yes, absolutely happy to um, provide both the documentation as well as the broad structural, um, you know, uh, uh, approach. What I'd say is um, we've made some Connecticut specific choices, so not everything uh, that we've done in terms of uh, structure would be the exact same way uh, done elsewhere, but a lot of the basic um, sort of building blocks uh, can certainly translate across state lines without too much pain, and uh, it would be easy enough to take our documentation and together with a brief primer um, make that pretty clear. So certainly happy to take a, the, under advisement the idea of a, of a real how-to guide, which I like, Val, and more importantly in the short term, uh, certainly make available to folks any of the resources to get their hands around um, how we've gone about it. Great. Thanks for that. And lastly, down to project nitty-gritty. How many megawatts have been deployed as a result of this solar lease program? I think on the commercial side, we've got about 10 in the ground right now mm -hmm. um, over the last 18 months uh, or so since we since we uh, really kicked off. Uh, and what we're doing now with this next fund we're raising, we've got about 7 or 8 megawatts that we're planning to get in the ground oh, between now and call it Q1 2017, uh, which we expect to be part of a fund to do about another 20 megawatts, probably total beyond that. So, um, you know, we, we, as with all things Connecticut, uh, we go with the mantra of small but mighty. Um, you know, we see it as a tip of the iceberg type of stuff and um, a single fund operating in a, a small environment, but the first 10 megawatts uh, we're pretty proud to have gotten done in this relatively short time, especially across this, this uh, asset class, as it were, that's never really had access to solar in this way. And um, I think equally excited about uh, turning on the or, or opening up the, the spigot even further for the next the next pool of um, of assets that we're looking at. And how long does it take to complete 
see the process. How long does it take to fund a project? You mentioned 10 megawatts. That's been in over the last two years. Mm -hmm, that's about right. Yeah, I think what, what the first project went live in uh, late 2014, end of 2014. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, it usually start to finish. Uh, we're happy if it's less than six months. Um, probably six months to a year from the point of time at which a customer says, yep, I think I'm interested to all of the challenges that we all know throughout the country of everything from working through documentation, uh, locking down the various, uh, you know, Connecticut has a, 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 a RPS schema for, for these mid-sized projects that provides a certain contracting approach, so those uh, recs uh, getting that lined up. Uh, the actual installation, navigating interconnection, all that jazz. Um, so you have to have a hearty customer partner, but part of the value of our local guys is uh, they know how to stick, stick it out along for the ride. And I think um, the, the Green Bank uh, support um, is at least uh, <laughs> helps, helps get folks comfortable that in the end they're going to get something that they want. Great. Well, that wraps it up for the Q&A session. Ben and Fiona, thank you very much, and congratulations on your SLICE Award, and great job opening up this difficult market sector. Well, thank Thanks you again to the... To the oh, yeah. Our pleasure. <laughs> Thanks yeah, to sorry. the audience. Thanks for participating. We do have more webinars coming up on two other SLICE Award programs. It's on Tuesday, July 26th, State Leadership in Clean Energy Awards for California and New York. If you have any questions, you can contact us at CISA.org. You'll find our email addresses there. It's also up on your screen now. And again, this uh, presentation, both presentations, have been recorded, and they'll be posted on our website in the next several days you'll get an email letting you know that the presentations have been uploaded. Thanks again to everyone. Thank you, Sam, for putting this all together. Have a great day.